So, I've been thinking, why the hell do we all like Pokemon so much? Bar a small break for one generation, I've been following this damn electric mouse around for 25 years now, and I know I'm not the only one. I have bought entire new consoles just to be able to play the latest Pokemon game, and literally the only other franchise with that power over me is Kingdom Hearts. Hello PSP that has literally only ever played Birth by Sleep and Corpse Party. In fact, Pokemon is so big it sports, according to Wikipedia, the title of the highest grossing media franchise ever. Nothing tops the Yellow Mouse, not even the House of Mouse. Disney would top it if you put all of its franchises together, but again, according to Wikipedia, they're separated for whatever legal reasons into Mickey and Friends or Disney princesses, etc. So as it stands, Pokemon is the top dog of media franchises. And I want to know why this is. What makes it so appealing to you, me, our friends, the kid who lives two doors down from you, and the 30-year-old businessman who's got kids himself? I'm determined to find the answer, so strap in and let's talk about how Pokemon Brainwash does. Alright, so most of you probably know this, but I promise it'll be relevant again later, so we're going over it real quick. Pokemon is the brainchild of Satoshi Tajiri, an autistic, child hobbyist bug collector who flunked high school, turned game enthusiast magazine writer, turned game developer and co-founder of Game Freak, along with Jinichi Masuda and Ken Sugimori. Legend is that one day Satoshi saw two Game Boys linked up together via the link cable and pictured insects being transferred along the wire from one console to another and was inspired to create a game that enabled him to share his love of bug collecting as a child with the world. The idea was pitched to Nintendo as Game Freak had already worked with them in the past during the original Yoshi game and Mario and Wario and they went, yeah alright, why not? Shigeru Miyamoto, the guy famous for this stuff, was brought on board as a mentor for Satoshi, and while there is so much more to this story than I'll put in this video because it's not really relevant, that's the basic story of how Pokemon was birthed into existence as an idea. Okay, so if you've been around this channel for literally any length of time, you'll know that I love all things Pokemon. The only reason I don't open up cards online is because I would go bankrupt if I did. But I love the cards, the games, and the anime. Admittedly, I've dedicated the time in my life sometimes to one thing more than the other, but bar a break in Gen 3 when I had a disillusioned moment of I want to be a grown-up, Pokemon is for kids, at whatever age that was, I have consistently been involved with something within Pokemon. Originally I collected the cards, played the games and watched the anime as a kid, then I slowly stopped collecting the cards because it was always a struggle to get my parents to buy them for me, come Gen 3 I wasn't watching playing anything, then in Gen 4 I was bought a DS and bought myself a Pokemon game for the first time, Pokemon Diamond, and went, alright, let's try this again. And I've played every mainline game since. In uni, I decided to binge catch up on the anime with the release of Pokemon Black and White, and I've spontaneously watched and caught up on the anime since then until Journeys was released, and finally in the Sun and Moon era, I got back into collecting the cards and started going to the pre-release events. Oh, and obviously I was part of the huge Pokemon Go hype when that was first released, literally the only time in my life as a woman ever that I have felt safe walking in a park at night time. Pokemon has always been there for me in some way, shape or form sometimes simmering in the background, and sometimes the highlight of my current week or month. In fact, escaping into the Pokemon world has been a flat-out coping mechanism at many points in my life. The first two generations were during my parents' divorce and the introduction of step-families and half-siblings. X and Y were released when I was in a really dark place in my life, and I started going to the Pokemon card pre-release events as a way to tackle getting over panic attacks that had been brought on by PTSD. And everybody I know that loves Pokemon has their own Pokemon story. It'll be different to mine, but I bet you've got one. No matter what generation you jumped onto the Pokemon bandwagon app, even if it's Sword and Shield, you'll have memories and a story to tell about your relationship with Pokemon. So in the interest of answering the question of why we all love Pokemon so much, I took to social media and asked over my Patreon, Discord, Instagram, links to all those in the description, wink wink, and YouTube, why do you guys love Pokemon? Well, it turns out that most of you seem to for roughly the same reasons. The themes that appeared multiple times in answers were memories and nostalgia, making friends slash bonding with people, a constant in life, a coping mechanism, the designs of the Pokemon and characters, and a love of collecting. We'll dive into those in more depth in a second, but I did want to highlight a couple of points that were brought up that made me realise that's also how I felt about Pokemon, despite these only being brought up once by individuals. These points being that the games are easy to pick up at any point, and that Pokemon reminds you not to take life too seriously. 
I really love both of these points because I think that I take these facts for granted and so they didn't occur to me when I was thinking about my own reasons for loving Pokemon. And actually, if we take that first one, I think we can look a little bit deeper into it. Well, the answer given, I'm pretty sure, is talking about how easy that individual finds the games to pick up at any point in their life. We can also talk about how the games can be easy to pick up just full stop by anyone who has the ability to play the console that they are on. Even the turn-based combat system contributes to the accessibility because a turn-based combat system will be easier for people with a physical disability to access and enjoy. And I say this as someone who has watched someone in their life lose the use of one of their hands for months and watching them try and play competitive, mostly first-person shooters online was difficult and frustrating to say the least because have you ever seen someone try to play an FPS with one hand? Obviously by far more painful, difficult and frustrating for them, but I hope you get my point. But both of these individual points rang true to me, so thank you to Craft Invaders and Jirachi respectively for pointing those out. And with that, let's dive into the more common reasons. I mean, what better place to start than the monsters themselves? I remember the first time I was shown Pokemon Red or Blue, I can't remember which one, was also the first time I was shown a Game Boy. I can't remember exactly how young I was, but me and my mum were visiting her childhood friend and their family. So as children do, they share what they're into at the time. And so I was shown this little black and white pixel character, because we're talking about an original Game Boy, that you could walk around the screen and then if you walked into the grass, these cool monsters would jump out at you and you had to battle and catch them. And that's what I did. I just walked around the grass in circles, excited to see what new monster that I'd never seen before was going to jump out at me. Some of them were cute, some of them were scary, and some of them looked like dinosaurs, and I was really obsessed with dinosaurs at the time. I mean, still am. So I thought these were the coolest things I'd ever seen. Elemental dinosaurs that you could capture and befriend, because what kid doesn't want a pet Iguanodon? Just me? Actually, it's worth noting that Pokemon Red and Blue and the popular BBC dinosaur documentary Walking with Dinosaurs were both released in October 1999 in the UK, and I wouldn't have seen Pokemon, I imagine, until just after its release. Plus, I'm pretty sure this is also the year I got introduced to Jurassic Park for the first time, so there's a good chance my dinosaur and prehistoric evolution fueled obsession at the time contributed to how much I instantly loved Pokemon. Sound off in the comments if a love of dinosaurs contributed to your love of Pokemon. Or, again, is it just me? But a lot of you echoed my thoughts and your answers. Something that caught your initial attention and keeps bringing you back is the designs of the Pokemon. There's something that draws us to them and makes us excited to see the next one in the game or the next generation as a whole. So what makes Pokemon so well designed? Let's start with the basics. The most important reason why Pokemon are so well designed is they're relatable. They take everyday objects and animals, give it a face, add only one or two extra features, and they have continued to stick to this rule, bar maybe in Gen 5. Joe Cat actually has a really great video that I'll link down below explaining this further that I highly recommend you go and check out. So from the get-go, our brain can look at any Pokemon and immediately go, yes, I know this, I feel a comfort with this. And then as a sweeping statement, whether you like or dislike the designs of any Pokemon, if we're to scroll through the national decks, we can put Pokemon designs into two categories cool monsters and beasts, or cute plushies. Some of them are a mixture of both, but nearly all of them fall into either one or both of these categories. And in fact, if we look at this even closer, those with evolutionary lines mostly evolve from cute plushies to cool monster or beast. This is especially true in the first four generations, but some examples are Wismer into Loudred, Bulbasaur into Venusaur, Shinx into Luxray, Axew into Haxorus, Fletchling into Talonflame, you get the gist. And it's easy to imagine how the cool monsters came into being. We're talking about a game here called Pocket Monsters. According to Sugimori himself in a translated interview that Porygon reported on in 2018, Pokemon were originally envisioned to be more tough looking overall. And it wasn't until a few people in the company expressed a desire for a few cuter creatures that they entertained that idea. And I think most people at least know that as a species, we seem to have an obsession with beasts and monsters, especially the idea of befriending them. And we'll get to why that is in a minute. But why are we also equally obsessed with befriending what could be interpreted as the opposite of that? And why is our love of the cute so overpowering that a brand that named itself Pocket Monsters decided to go with a cute mouse as a mascot? I'm going to make an assumption and say that most of you watching this have at least a rough idea of what kawaii is. But for the uncultured amongst us, it basically means cute. 
specifically the kind of cute associated with round or small shapes, pastel colours and this specific face being plastered on anything edible from fruit to milk cartons. You can't use the words completely interchangeably though. Like in the West, what you might refer to as a cute boy or girl isn't necessarily kawaii unless they're wearing kawaii aesthetic clothes and accessories, most likely pastels, probably pink somewhere, maybe cute makeup, cat ears. Think sweet Lolita. This is the epitome of kawaii. And while most of us might be under the impression that the kawaii aesthetic is a relatively new trend, the rise of kawaii actually started in the 1970s as a rebellious way for girls to write. They used mechanical pencils, which produced much finer lines, made the shape language much larger and rounder, and had their characters accompanied by little pictures. Think dotting your eyes with a love heart. But most likely, when you think of kawaii, you think of a face like this. It's the same face structure that every Sanrio character has, along with most Japanese area mascots. The Tokyo Olympics mascots, Kero from Cardcaptors, Sailor Moon's cat, and plenty of Pokemon, including Pikachu. And I really hate the scientific reason why this face is so popular, but the long and short of it is that you find this face aesthetically pleasing because it reminds your brain of babies. The large head relative to body size, bear in mind the average adult is seven to eight heads tall, the protruding forehead, large eyes more in the middle of the face, mouth and nose in closer proximity to the eyes, the roundness. These characteristics are classified as the baby schema and both the standard kawaii face and obviously baby faces have this in common. And when our brain sees something that reminds us of babies, no matter what gender we are, hormones such as dopamine, the happy hormone, and oxytocin, the cuddle hormone, are released because our body's perceived biological need to protect the future of our species. In fact, there was even a study done by researchers at the University of Hiroshima that found that students who were shown pictures of puppies and kittens before performing a variety of tasks actually did better at said tasks. The conclusion being that because the brain felt like it had something to protect, it paid more attention to doing it. And even the word kawaii links back to babies. The word was originally an adjective uh, derived from an ancient word, kawahayushi, which literally translates to face flushing, the original meaning of ashamed, can't bear to see, feel pity. And then as languages do, it evolved into can't leave someone alone, I must care for them like you would a baby. So Pikachu is kind of the perfect kawaii. The design ticks all those boxes for that baby-related hormone release and even has the blushing cheeks to match. And if we just look at some basic stage Pokemon, I wonder how many of them tick those boxes. Obviously the baby Pokemon do, all starter Pokemon tick most of those boxes, all the generational Pikas do, Eevee and the Evolutions, the mythical Pokemon, all basic stage dog and cat Pokemon. Hopefully you're getting my drift here. There are a lot of Pokemon that our brains and bodies want to protect. So now we know why we scientifically can't help but love the cute Pokemon, what about the monsters? Human beings love of beasts and monsters is old. So old it actually predates written language. According to the Smithsonian Magazine, the oldest written guide to exercising ghosts is 3,500 years old. And according to Durham University anthropologist Dr. Jamie Tarani, Jack and the Beanstalk could be traced back to when Eastern and Western Indo-European languages split more than 5,000 years ago. Even Beauty and the Beast is 4,000 years old. And that's just Western monsters. If you Google Japanese monsters, creatures such as the Tanuki, Kitsune, Kappa, and the Yokai, a separate class of supernatural entities and spirits, are brought up. In fact, the creation of the yokai are intertwined into Japanese creation mythology and appear in some of the first Japanese written literature from around 3,000 years ago. But why are we so obsessed with them? I originally found this hard to pinpoint because the term monster itself is such an umbrella term that can hold different meanings depending on the context of the conversation or where it's being said. It can be used to refer to something cute and fluffy like the Tanuki and Kitsune of Japan, or something more terrifyingly animalistic from Jaws to Godzilla, to something humanoid like Frankenstein or zombies, or even to something spiritual like the yokai or ghosts. Maybe the most terrifying but also fascinating definition of a monster is when we're using it to refer to a person. In my personal opinion, some of the best horror movies have the creature monster in them, but it's the humans in them that somehow create some of the most terrifying scenes. For example, the racism, misogyny, and child abuse in It is just as unsettling and terrifying as Pennywise the Clown because of how rooted in reality these situations are. But as a general, I think Eli Roth puts it best. Monsters are a reflection of ourselves. 
And that's what makes them so captivating. They hold a mirror up to society, our fears and our problems of the time, and say, look at it. Which is why there are so many different types of monsters. They evolve as society does. Our best documented versions of this obviously exist in the modern era, but to give you some examples, Dracula is our fear of dying and our hopes of overcoming it. Frankenstein represents our fear of science, hence it being considered the first true science fiction story. Jekyll and Hyde is our fear of modern psychology and discovering what's hiding behind the societal masks we all wear. And zombies, noticeably the most common traditional monster in our current media, represent our fear of groups in general and our othering mentality towards them. Bearing this in mind, there's actually a notable and kind of terrifying correlation between the rise of zombie media popularity in a post 9-11 world. Even The Walking Dead, for example, was first published as a comic in 2003, a mere two years afterwards. But what about the creature monster like in Pokemon? What do they represent? Eli Roth, again, the producer behind Cabin Fever, Hostel, and The Last Exorcism, pontificates that the reason specifically fantastical monster creatures are so popular with children is that they don't have to follow the rules. They can do anything they want. Which is obviously appealing to a child who lives in a world controlled by rules they may or may not even understand. It's a commonly observed part of being a child to ask why, for example. The reason this happens is the brain trying to gather information on why the rules set upon the child exist. Why hold hands when crossing the road? Why only one spoonful of cough medicine? Why don't we play with knives? As adults, while we stick to the rules, the child doesn't have the answers as to why they exist in the first place. And this can very easily lead to feelings of frustration. Living vicariously through the fantastical creature monster helps the child, or the adult, to escape the rules of society. Maybe that's why it holds such a deep connection with millennials and Gen Z. Even though a lot of us are adults now, with the oldest Gen Zs being born in 1997, we're both renowned for being more stressed and anxious than previous generations. There are a plethora of studies confirming this. You only need a quick Google to bring up articles such as why is Gen Z so depressed? Or millennials and Gen Z are more anxious than previous generations. University of Alberta sociologist, and I might butcher this name, Lisa Strohschein, says in the last 50 years, the expectation has been that each generation will do better than the one before it. This is the first generation where that's not necessarily true. And this sentiment is echoed by UK MP Lord David Willits in his book, The Pinch, how the baby boomers took their children's future and why they should give it back. The same frustration with societal rules that we had as children statistically still appear to be with a lot of us to this day. And so it's easy to see why we'd keep a love of a creature monster game for so long. And maybe that's the genius of Pokemon. Because while playing as the monster would be effective in manifesting the roleplay of breaking rules, there would end up being this barrier where we are inherently aware that we are in fact not a monster. We are human. And so Pokemon gives us that same power of escape, but puts it in a more realistic context. It puts us in a world that doesn't seem too different from our own, a world that's not impossible for us to live in, but just different enough that we prefer it to our own and then puts the creatures that break the rules of society in our own hands and in our control. Which brings us to why you've always wanted to complete that Pokedex and how that keeps you coming back for more. All right, I'm gonna throw some facts at you. According to the University of Edinburgh, around 15% of the UK adult population is diagnosed with something that classifies them as neurodivergent. But according to ADHDaware.org, the actual number of people who are neurodivergent, accounting for those who haven't been diagnosed, is more likely around 30 to 40%. Even myself, for example, I have only just been referred for an autism assessment by my doctor because they think it's likely that I am. From the same website, apparently only 1% of people are diagnosed with autism, but two thirds of ADHD people will have symptoms that are listed on the autistic spectrum. And there are recent studies that say children who are born from women who are immediately prior to the child being conceived on hormonal birth control, like the pill, are 30% more likely to be neurodivergent. Bear in mind the pill became widely available for all women come around the 70s. And why is that so important? Well, coincidentally, according to psychologytoday.com, around 33 to 40% of people collect something, which is almost the exact percentage of people who are neurodivergent. And the whole concept of Pokemon itself, as stated earlier, told you it'd be relevant, is designed by our favorite autistic game designer, Satoshi Tajiri. 
Now, I'm not saying that everyone who likes Pokemon is neurodivergent in some way. I mean, this thing took over entire schools in the 90s and early 2000s to the point where there were bans on bringing the cards onto school property. But I can't help but feel like this all can't be one huge coincidence. I mean, it just seems to be too on the nose for that 30 to 40% ratio being brought up so many times. Even on a personal note, I know I've met more neurodiverse people through Pokemon than I've ever met through any other activities in my life. Or I learned that friends I've known for many years who also really like Pokemon got a neurodiverse diagnosis as a child that I wasn't aware of, or they're in the progress of getting one now in their adult life. In fact, I always feel like a fish out of water when I bring Pokemon up around people in more normal life situations, cause remarks like, I didn't know there was a card game come up. And I'm like, what? I'm sorry, you're in your late 20s, Ted. Let's call them Ted. You lived through Pokemania. How on earth did you avoid that? Although by far the more common remark that I get is that they didn't know Pokemon was still a thing. Like they didn't know about the new games or cards. So why do people collect things? From what I've read, it seems to come down to four main points. One, the thrill of the hunt, the same reason anyone does anything from clubbing on a Friday night to skydiving, gotta love a dopamine and adrenaline release. Two, nostalgia, which we'll be talking about later. Three, socialising. This makes sense, having the same interests gives you something to talk about with people. Although it is worth noting that specifically autistic children may actually find the opposite when it comes to their special interests, as they are more often an intense interest and this can ostracise them from their peers when young. Although it would be safe to argue that with the access to social media and being able to find people with the same interests through a hashtag and the average age for people being introduced to social media getting younger, that this isn't the case as much as it used to be. And finally, what I found a few places refer to as the darker side of collecting, although I personally disagree with the title that it's been given. A way to create order. Basically, Freudian psychologists argue that collecting is a way of imposing order on the world, and that the act of collecting is especially common in those who have abandonment issues from childhood, or feel a lack of control in their current lives. Going even further into this, some argue that this is the reason many middle-aged people take up collecting something, to deal with the lack of control felt during a midlife crisis. I couldn't find any results from my personal theory, but one could argue that we've scientifically evolved so quickly we can now expand our lives longer than what our brains are prepared for, especially when you consider the fact that a mere 200 years ago the average lifespan worldwide was only 25, and that the term midlife crisis wasn't coined until 1957, only around 60 years ago. The midlife crisis is a fairly new cultural phenomenon that happens around when a person reaches 40 and they're faced with the slow demise of their life towards death. Something that certainly wouldn't have happened in the 1800s where you were lucky if you got to 40. And I feel it's easy to see why someone would want to create order at that time in their lives. And while the points just mentioned account for the general neurotypical population, I think that these are just compounded with people on the neurodiverse spectrum that have intense interests. I did try to research why intense interests in neurodivergent people exist, but while the symptom is widely known, I couldn't actually find any reasons. Although I did find this quote on autism.org from an anonymous young person that I think clarifies my point pretty well. My mind was constantly worrying with thoughts, worries and concerns. The time spent with my intense interest was the only time in which I had a clear mind. It gave me that much sought after relaxation. And I mean like, hands up in the comments if that's how you feel about Pokemon too. Cause I know that's exactly how I feel about Pokemon. And I don't care if Freudian psychologists want to call self-soothing and finding comfort in collecting a dark side, it can be hard when your brain doesn't function in the way the world is made for, so providing you're not harming anybody, you do you, boo. In some ways, the points you guys made about bonds, nostalgia and memories are the most important points. The previous points we talked about were what dragged you in, but these are what kept you here. They were by far the most common reason for loving Pokemon brought up by you guys, and I'm going to talk about them together because all of these aspects feed off each other into a compounding effect. Pokemon was marketed, produced, and sold as a social game. The entire basis of Pokemon came from the idea of trading, something you inherently can't do by yourself. And I cannot think of a single game that did this prior to Pokemon. Even Zelda, Oracle of Ages slash Seasons, which you also needed the link cable of a Game Boy 4, was released in 2001. In English, Pokemon made its catchphrase, gotta catch them all, and then made that impossible to do without friends. Honestly, especially for the time when most advertising was done by TV, billboards, and word of mouth, it's genius. 
It made word of mouth an integral part of completing the games. Let me know how you were first introduced to Pokemon in the comments, because I know for sure that before I saw any adverts on TV, I was shown it by a friend. Friends are also an inherent part of the card game between trading and battling. Pokemon is built on friendship and bonds, and I genuinely think this point is the reason it has continued to be so successful over so many years. Yes, it has evolved so you no longer have to be sitting next to the people you're battling or trading with, but these are games you physically cannot complete by yourself for the most part, unless, again, somehow you have two consoles and both games. Bonding is an important part of the essential gameplay of Pokemon, and so we cannot dismiss how important this is to the longevity of the Pokemon franchise. Hell, at this point, it's not just friends that it's helping out. It's families as well, now as Gen 1 is are settling down and having kids. We've made memories together as kids, and we're still making memories today using Pokemon to bond us. And yes, having socialising as an integral part of the game is a great marketing strategy, but our bodies also reward us for being social. As humans, we're biologically very socially dependent creatures, so having connection and being able to reinforce it is incredibly important to our physical and mental health. There are plenty of studies that show that those with healthy social groups experience less mental and physical illness because face-to-face -face contact releases a whole cascade of neurotransmitters and, like a vaccine, they protect you now, in the present, and well into the future. The going theory is that being social was a key strength that helped our species when we switched from hunting at night to the day, when lots more predators were around, and so strong social and communication skills became essential to our species' survival. Being social is an evolutionary advantage, and our bodies reward us for being social and having bonds. Which leads me nicely onto how nostalgia plays such an important part. So, what is nostalgia, and why is it so important? Nostalgia is defined as a sentimental longing or wistful affection for a period in the past. It's an incredibly personal emotion to feel, and would be triggered by different things depending on the individual person. According to Dr. Christine Bacho, Professor of Psychology at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, I'm very sorry if I've mispronounced any of that, in New York, it plays two incredibly important roles in our lives. Firstly, it's the emotions that help bond us to our family when we're growing. And that makes sense. Unless you're brought up in an abusive or neglectful situation, even as a child, you'll be processing the fond emotions you have of being looked after by your parents. And so nostalgia will bond you to your family in the early years of your life, which will be an evolutionary useful bond to have while you're still relying on your parents. The second role that nostalgia plays in our lives is far more personal though, in that it helps to form a sense of self. In processing our memories of yesteryear, it helps our brains analyse what we were like, and what we liked about that, and then what we're like in the present day in comparison to that. And this helps us form an idea of the type of person we want to be going forward. So nostalgia is the reason that our personalities are constantly changing, hopefully for the better, but it does so in a unifying way that helps us feel connected to ourselves rather than feeling like we're looking at a stranger in the mirror. And so the memories and bonds you gained using Pokemon have actually helped you stay physically and mentally healthier over the years, and the nostalgia from the memories you have with Pokemon changed you, probably for the better, into the person you are today. And finally, I think the most surprising reason that you guys brought up to as to why you love Pokemon was that it is or has been a coping mechanism at some point in your life. I mean, I don't know why I'm so surprised. As I stated earlier, Pokemon has definitely been a coping mechanism for me in different ways and at different points in my life. From escapism as a child, to literally being a tool I actively use to progress towards healing PTSD. But I think that maybe the thing that surprised me wasn't the fact that it came up in your answers, more so in the amount of answers it came up in. But when we compile all the reasons above, including even Jirachi's point of view that it reminds us not to take life too seriously, it makes sense. So let's strip that all back. How did Pokemon brainwash us? Why do we all love it so much? And why is it the best selling media franchise of all time? Basically, to be blunt, you're biologically programmed to like it. It makes you feel things. The environment it's set in and the monsters are both familiar enough to invite us in, while different enough to be an escape mechanism that uses the creature monster trope in the most effective way possible. And by complete accident, the game was released into a generation of children that would grow up still feeling a frustration of the rules that the creature monster helped them cope with as children, and therefore they continued to use this coping mechanism that they already knew into their adult lives. 
From the designs and your personal reason for collecting and the use of bonding in its gameplay that helps create memories and nostalgia, it releases a lot of oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine and adrenaline along the way. Hormones that by nature keep you coming back for more. Its clever marketing made sure the games are incompletable without friends and this meant that you had to talk to friends about the games and encourage them or their parents to buy the game you don't have. And in doing so, you were inadvertently rewarded by your body with better physical and mental health for being social simply because of how we've evolved. And then the longevity of the games keeps it as a constant in life, which compounds all of the effects above year upon year, new generation after new generation. As time goes by, Pokemon helps us adventure and connect and generates a feeling of more completeness within ourselves through nostalgia. It literally makes you feel more whole. And the longer you like it for, the more likely you are to intensely feel these effects. Pokemon may have been imagined out of the mind of one man, but the concept it holds close to its heart resonate with people around the world. And with that, I'd like to thank you for watching the video. I'd love to hear your reasons for loving Pokemon in the comments, and if any of the points I brought up hit a particular note within you. As per usual, please hit that like button for the algorithm, and I want to take a quick moment to thank my patrons for being so patient with me this last, like, half a year now. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please think about clicking the link in the description, or go check the Instagram. But for now, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.